examine the subject of the Sabbath in relation to three things, the sanctuary, salvation, and righteousness by faith. But don't, don't get too concerned. It's not going to be too, too long. Mm -hmm. uh, but we want, to, we want to mix these three elements together, the sanctuary, salvation, and righteousness by faith. This is the context in which we're going to look at uh, the subject of the Sabbath tonight. So I've captioned this, welcome to the sacred place. In the Old Testament, in particular, in the Old Testament, there seems to be a close connection between the Sabbath and the sanctuary. There is a close connection between the Sabbath and the sanctuary, particularly in the Old Testament. In fact, the doctrine of the Sabbath and the doctrine of the sanctuary are clothed and covered with some of the same theological language. And we find this both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. One of the first aspects that we want to look at is the fact that both the Sabbath and the sanctuary are designed by God to be signs of God's sanctifying power. The Sabbath, both the Sabbath and the sanctuary were signs of God's sanctifying power. Let's begin in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, and I have the text on the screen. Genesis chapter 2, 1 and 3. We're looking at the end of creation week. The end of creation week. And I want us to pay a, a close attention to how the Bible, the language of the Bible in connection with that text. So Genesis chapter 2, 1 to 3, the Bible says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Now notice these things concerning the first week of creation. This is the first week of creation. Notice the language that the Bible uses here. In verse 2, in verse 2, we are told, that God ended his work. God ended his work on the seventh day, not the Sabbath. God ended his work, the Bible, the, the language of the Bible. God ended his work on the seventh day, not on the Sabbath day. God rested, verse 2, God rested on the seventh day. That's the first week of creation, not the Sabbath. It says God rested on the seventh day. In verse 3, it says, God blessed and sanctified the seventh day and made it the Sabbath. God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it the seventh day, and made that seventh day the Sabbath. From a biblical theological point of view, there is a difference. The Bible makes, puts a difference between the seventh day and the Sabbath. So God blessed the seventh day. He ended his work on the seventh day. He sanctified, hallowed the seventh day and made the seventh day into the Sabbath. We're going to get back to that later on as we tie this up together. And we're going to see how in relation to the subject of the sanctuary and righteousness by faith, all that comes into play. Because that language is again used in the New Testament as Paul makes a very significant point to the Christian believers. Let's look at the language of Exodus chapter 31, verse 13. Now, some of those texts uh, you've looked at before in some of the presentations that were done before, but I want to use them in connection with the subject matter of the Sabbath, the sanctuary, righteousness by faith. In Exodus 31, verse 13, God says to Moses, speak also unto the children of Israel and say to them, verily my Sabbath you shall keep in verse 16, it says the Sabbath, but the principle here covers both the ceremonial Sabbath and the weekly Sabbath. My Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign, look at the language, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that sanctifies you. So the Sabbath is a sign of God's sanctifying power. The Sabbath is a sign that God is the one who sanctifies the believer. 
the very thing, now look at the connection that, that God is making. The very thing that God did to the seventh day, God wants to do to the people. He sanctified the seventh day. And that's why the, in Genesis, that language is used in chapter two. The very thing that God does to the seventh day, he sanctified it and set it apart for holy use. He now wants to do to the people. So the Sabbath, God's sanctifying power over the people, the Sabbath becomes a sign of that. The very thing is repeated in Exodus, uh, in Ezekiel. Look at the language that, that God uses in Ezekiel 37. Now remember, the Sabbath is a sign that God is the one sanctifying the people. Look at the connection that is made there with the sanctuary. Ezekiel 37, verse 28. Listen, look at what God says. And the heathens, that's the unbelievers. When they look at the nation of Israel, and they look at the priest with his beautiful regalia, and all the ceremonial things that were done in the sanctuary, God is saying to, to, to his people, the heathens shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, make Israel holy, set Israel apart, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. So the very same language that God used for the Sabbath uh, in terms of the Sabbath being a sign that he, Jehovah, was the one sanctifying his people, God is again using that very same language concerning the sanctuary. When the heathens see, and when Ezekiel, by the way, when Ezekiel wrote that, uh, the, 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 the scholars tell us he was in Babylon uh, during the Babylonian captivity. The, the sanctuary was destroyed in Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. They had, they had burnt down the sanctuary. And God is saying, listen, that sanctuary that I gave you with all the ceremonial things, that was to teach the heathens that I, Jehovah, I am the only God who can sanctify sinners and make them holy. Now in Leviticus, we find, we find a very interesting text. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 30, tie in the Sabbath and the sanctuary. Listen to what it says. You shall keep, God is speaking to the children of Israel. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. God has tied together the principles of the Sabbath and the sanctuary. And in the context of righteousness by faith, we find that principle flowing right through the Bible from the Old Testament right through to the New Testament in the context of righteousness by faith. Now, I want to say this before I continue. One of the most difficult concepts for Christian to grasp is the concept of righteousness by faith and walking by faith. As human beings, as sinful human beings, we are prone to work for what we want. When it comes to salvation, God flips the script and he's given us a free gift. He says to us, believe in that, accept it, accept it by faith. The principles of righteousness by faith. And this is the context in which we want to look at the Sabbath tonight. The context of righteousness by faith. So both the Sabbath, and I've put, the, I've put the, the, the note here on the screen. Both the Sabbath and the sanctuary, based on the text that we the, the, the three texts that we just looked at. Both the Sabbath and the sanctuary were to be God's signs, plural, that he was the one sanctifying Israel and by extension, the only one who can sanctify or make the sinner holy. And the Sabbath, both the Sabbath and the sanctuary, well, the, the ceremonial Sabbaths as well. So the ceremonial Sabbaths, the weekly Sabbath, and the sanctuary were to teach the children of Israel that their only sanctifying power was God himself. Now, when we examine the Sabbath, particularly from it is established in the Old Testament, the word rest can be both a verb and a noun. The word rest, R-E-S-T, is both a verb and a noun. And they are used in both the Old and the New Testament. So when many times when you read the context, or when we read a text, we need to read the context of the text to find out whether the word rest is being used as a verb or it is being used as a noun. Now, in, in the Old Testament in particular, in particular, when the word rest is used as a noun, remember it is both a verb and a noun. And we know what, it, what is the difference between a verb and a noun. A verb is an action. A verb is an action. A noun is a thing. When the word rest is used as a noun, particularly in the Old Testament, 
It means resting place or the place for rest. And we find that beautifully demonstrated in uh, or described in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 41. The context here is the dedication of the temple of, that Solomon built. Uh, remember, David wanted to build that temple. The, the sanctuary that Moses built was in a tent. And David said, look at all the beautiful houses that I have for myself, a nice palace and so on. I want to build a nice house for the Lord. And God said to him, your hands are too bloody. Your son Solomon who is going to be a peaceful guy, will build the sanctuary, will build the temple, will build uh, that beautiful house for me. Solomon built the house, beautiful house, beautiful house. And it was a time for the dedication. And, and Solomon himself is praying that prayer of dedication. It's recorded both in Second Chronicles and in the Psalms. And so, uh, so Solomon is praying that prayer. And he's asking God, Solomon is asking God to move from the tent that Moses built and to move into the temple, into the beautiful structure that he had built. He's asking God to move. Remember, the Shekinah glory, God's presence was manifested in the tent. The Shekinah glory was manifested in the tent. And the children of Israel saw that. They saw when sacrifices were offered, the fire came down and consumed. And, and they knew that God's presence was in the tent. So here is Solomon here at the dedication of the temple. And he's praying that prayer. And he said, Now therefore arise, O Lord, into thy resting place. Some versions simply say, into thy rest. But the word rest in the text is a noun. And when it is used as a noun, it refers to resting place. So he's saying to God, we want you to move from the tent and come into that beautiful temple that I have built for you, and we are dedicating it, and there is no dedication without the presence of the Lord. So now, therefore, Lord, arise from where you are in the tent and move into your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. And that text is showing us how the word rest is used as a noun, and when it is used as a noun, it refers directly to a resting place. Now, in the Bible, Rest is both a verb and a noun, if we have seen. I want to submit to us tonight that we have gotten, many of us, we have gotten the verb right. We've gotten the verb right. You know what actions to do concerning rest. And we heard the testimony uh, tonight coming from Ellison as it refers to resting. The action of resting. The greatest challenge that I believe God has with us as Sabbath keepers is to get us to understand the null aspect of rest, rest in place. And so this is, this is the slant that I want us to take tonight as we examine the Sabbath in the context of righteousness by faith and rest as a null, the place of rest, not just the action of resting. So we want to go back into an Old Testament episode, the deliverance of the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage and their journey through the wilderness for 40 years and their entrance into Canaan. Now it was, it was Moses who led the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. Amen? Amen. Now while it was Moses who led the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage, and through the 40 years in the wilderness, it was Joshua who led them into Canaan. Joshua, did, uh, Moses did not lead the children of Israel into Canaan. In fact, the Bible tells us he died in the wilderness. God buried him. And later on in the book of Jude, we are told that God resurrected Moses. So Moses was the one who led them out of Egyptian bondage, but he did not have the privilege of taking them into, into Canaan. It was Joshua. It was Joshua who led the children of Israel. One sec. Yes. Just correct. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, so we're saying, while it was Moses that brought them out of Egyptian bondage, it was Joshua who led them into Canaan. And we find this in, in uh, Joshua chapter 21, uh, the record of that. Uh, the transition of, uh, throughout the book of Joshua, the transition of power from Moses to Joshua. And Joshua cried out to the Lord, to the Lord, I'm not worthy. I'm not like Moses. And God had to say to him over and over and over, do not fear the people. 
I am with you. Just as I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you and you shall do mighty things and so on. Now, after wandering for 40 years in the wilderness, they finally entered into Canaan where they found their resting place. Canaan was to be the resting place for the children of Israel. Now, before God's appointment of Joshua, before Joshua could be appointed as the leader of the children of Israel, there were two major incidents. Yeah, there were more, but I want to point out two major incidents in the life of Joshua in preparing him for the leadership, which is to lead the children of Israel into Canaan, which is their resting place. One, he had to, he was appointed as a spy to spy out the land. We're going to talk about that in a while, but the very, the first incident that I want us to pay attention to is recorded in Numbers chapter 13, verse 16. Two major incidents take place in the life of Joshua in preparing him and in God's uh, appointing him as the leader who's going to take them into Canaan. The very first thing that God did, and this is in relation to assigning him as one of the spies to go into Canaan. Listen to what God did in Numbers chapter 13, verse 16. Now, these are the names of the men that Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Hosea, the son of Nun, Joshua. Get this. Joshua's name is changed. We only know Joshua by his, his second name. The, the change that he received. But Joshua's first name is Oshea. The, the H is silent. Oshea in, in the Hebrew. Oshea, which means helped by God. Oshea means helped by God. We know that in Hebrew, names have meaning. And, and names are not just given by Kivai. Names have meaning. And so Oshea, which means helped by God. The very first thing that Moses had to do in preparing Joshua to go into spy the land and in preparing him for his leadership responsibility in taking the children of Israel into Canaan is that his name had to be changed. So his name is changed from Oshea to Joshua. Oshea means helped by God, but Joshua means Jehovah is salvation. Jehovah is salvation. The salvation of the children of Israel in entering Canaan, Joshua now personifies that. Now in the Hebrew, the word Joshua, the, the name is Joshua, but in the Greek, it is Jesus. Hmm. The Old Testament Joshua, mm -hmm. who is appointed to lead the children of Israel into Canaan, that man, before he takes up his responsibility of leading the children of Israel into Canaan, he is given the name of the Messiah. So it is Joshua in the, in the Greek, but in the Hebrew is Jesus. And in the Aramaic, Jesus. He is given the name of the Messiah. He is given the name of the Deliverer. And that is very significant in relation to what we are doing here. This is because Joshua means Jesus. By the way, Joshua means Jesus. That's what we are saying. Hmm. So, so Moses, Moses is about to send the spies. By the way, when you read the story of, of the spies, the 12 spies, it is not God. It was not God's intention to send spies. The children of Israel said to Moses, you, we want you to send spies. Hmm. God never intended to send any spies. God said to the children of Israel, I am going to give you a promised land. It is going to be full with milk and honey. All I want you to do is move in. I want you to inhabit houses that you did not build. Hmm. I want you to drink from vineyards that you did not plant. I want you to drink from wells that you did not dig. All I want you to do is go and inhabit the land. I, God says, I, Jehovah, will drive out your enemies from before you. Simply go and possess the land. Amen. The children of Israel said to God, to Moses, we do not believe the report of God. We want to examine the thing for ourselves. We want you to send. Right. We want you to send out spies. 
to examine the land. God says to Moses, listen, I'm going to handpick two of those spies myself. Caleb and Joshua. We know the story. Caleb and Joshua basically came back with bad news. They said to the children of Israel, let's go forward and possess the land. To the children of Israel, that was bad news. They were hoping for good news, which says they stay in Canaan. So the 12 spies, according to God's program, the 12 spies brought back a false report. We cannot possess the land. There are too many militarized persons in Canaan. In fact, we saw giants. We saw giants in the land, which indicates that we cannot take the land. I'm trying not to preach. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> and in fact, they said, we didn't just see giants, but the people saw us as grasshoppers. Yeah, and I'm yeah, saying yeah. to myself, what kind of spy are you that <laughs> the people see you? If you're spying out the land, they're not supposed to see you. So the people see us as grasshoppers. We cannot take the land. And Joshua and Caleb are saying, listen, the land is a good land. In fact, the land is so good that it takes two of us to carry a bunch of grapes. It's a good land. Let's go. We tasted the grapes. We saw everything in there. Let's go and possess the land. And the children of Israel are doubting God. They are doubting God's promise. They are doubting God's word. That he's going to give them a land. Just go in and possess it. Paul in the New Testament takes up this episode of the children of Israel's journey in the wilderness and they're entering into Canaan and the episode of the spies and all of that. And Paul, when we believe that the book of Hebrews was written by Paul, Paul, and even if you don't believe that, it doesn't make a difference. Just believe the word of God. Paul, now in this, so I'm going to say Paul. Paul in the book of Hebrews takes up that story and he's about to make a point to the New Testament church. And he goes down into some sweet theology as he tries to build on the principle of, of righteousness by faith and what it means to trust in God and what it means to walk by faith. It is beautifully expressed in Hebrews chapter 4. I want us to begin in Hebrews chapter 3 from verse 18. The text on the screen. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 18. Let's take the story there. As, as Paul picks up on the Old Testament episode, he says, to whom swear he, and he here is God, to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. Now rest here is a no, because it is talking about a resting place, Canaan. To whom swear God that they would not enter into Canaan, the resting place, but to them that believed not. Then he says in verse 19, so we see that they could not enter in. Where? Enter into Canaan, the place of rest, because of unbelief. We know what happened to, to all those who were 20 years and up or, or above 20. They all died in the wilderness. And those who entered Canaan were the younger generation who left Egypt. The younger generation who had left Egypt 20 years and down. They were now adults 40 years later when they entered into Canaan. So Paul is saying, God swore that these people would not enter Canaan, the place of rest, because of unbelief. Why? Because the only prerequisite for rest is faith. Belief here in Hebrews chapter in Hebrews chapter three and four, belief is synonymous with faith. Sometimes there is a play, a little difference in play on the words, but belief here in in, X, uh, in Hebrews chapter three and four is synonymous with belief uh, with faith. So God is saying, and and Paul is repeating this principle here that the prerequisite, the only prerequisite for rest, is faith. Faith in what? Faith in the word of God. So the children of Israel who did not believe what God said. What did God say? God said, I'm going to give you a land that is full with milk and honey. God says, I'm going to give you houses that you did not build. God says, I'm going to give you vineyards that you did not plant. God says, I'm going to give you wells that you did not dig. I'm going to drive out the inhabitants of the nations before you. Just go possess the land. What do we see the children of Israel doing? We see them fighting war. They are fighting battles to get that which God had already promised them. 
God said it is yours. Just take it. And, 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 and Paul is saying the generation who died in the wilderness, they could not enter their rest or their rest in place because of unbelief. So the only prerequisite for entering rest is faith in God. What did they not believe? They did not believe God's word. I would give you a lamp. Now let's go into Hebrews 4. Into Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 4, I'm not going to follow the chronological order of the verses. I'm going to go back and forth to, to pin the picture that I really want us to grasp. Let's begin in verse 8. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 8. So Joshua, remember, Joshua is now appointed as the leader and he takes them into Canaan. Hebrews 4 verse 8 says, now most of the English Bible say, if, for if Jesus had hmm. given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? That text has given people so much stress. Hmm. Plenty, plenty stress, including some of us as Seventh-day Adventists. In fact, I've heard this text read as a, as a question. It is not a question. None of the versions of the Bible have this verse as a question. It is not a question. It's a statement. Now, the very first thing we have to understand and recognize about this text is that it is not referring to the New Testament Jesus. It is referring to the Old Testament Jesus. Mm -hmm. If you have a very good study Bible, it actually says Joshua. That's right. Remember, Joshua and Jesus are the same word. It's the same word. So in the translations, the translators just took the, the, the Jesus that they thought. The Messiah. But it is not referring to the Messiah. It is referring to the Old Testament Joshua. The one whose name was changed from Hosea to Joshua. It's the same name. So read the text with the understanding, the correct understanding. It says, for if Joshua, Old Testament Joshua, had given them rest. That's the children of Israel. Because Paul is talking about the episode in the Old Testament. He is using the episode in the Old Testament to, to, to teach a lesson to the New Testament church. So he says, for if Joshua in the Old Testament had given them rest, who is the rest? Who is the them? The them are all those who were 20 and below who actually entered Canaan. If Joshua had actually given them rest, then he, Joshua, would not have afterward spoken of appointed. The, 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 the Greek word spoken here is to point, to direct the attention to another day. Some of our Christian friends who, who worship on Sunday take mm -hmm. that text to say, Jesus gave them another day of worship, but that's not what the Bible is talking about. Mm. This is the context of the text. When Joshua brought the children of Israel into Canaan, remember Canaan is the place of rest. Jesus says, I'm going to give you a resting place. I'm going to give you a place to rest. As soon as Joshua brought them into Canaan, Joshua began to point them to another day that was coming. The day that they entered Canaan, from the, from the very moment they entered Canaan, Joshua said to them, this is not your real rest. Your real rest is yet to come. And he was pointing them to the day when the real Joshua, the true Joshua, the Jesus would come, who is the only one who could give rest. This is the context that Paul is, is, is writing here. As soon as Joshua brought them into Canaan, he said to them, in, in other words, Joshua is almost saying to them, listen, Canaan, which is the place of rest, is a sign of the real rest that God wants to give to you. He points them to the coming Messiah. He pointed them to the coming Messiah. But this is what we see in the life of the children of Israel who were in Canaan. Now, follow, follow the argument. Follow the argument. Follow the argument of Paul. Paul is saying that Joshua brought the children of Israel into Canaan. Canaan was their resting place or their place of rest. Yet, 
in the life and history of the children of Israel, we see them fighting every nation. From the mm. time they entered Canaan, from the time they entered Canaan, they were fighting to possess a land that God had already promised them for free. Wow. In other words, they That's entered the Canaan. Get this. They entered Canaan, the place of rest. Uh. Pastor they Peter. were in the place of rest, yet they had no rest. Wow. That, that's a wow moment. You have to yes, pause. That's wow. That's wow. Please, please, <laughs> please. That's you need wow. to pause. Let people digest that. Because you're going along in 90 miles an hour, and I am following you at 60 miles an hour. I need, I need a wow. He needs a rest. He needs a rest. I need, yeah. <laughs> Man, that is the go ahead, my brother. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> no, that, that, was, right. that, was a good, that was a good rest. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. So let's we, we have to get this. We have to get this. Amen. The children of Israel, God says, I'm gonna give you a place of rest. Not just the verb, not just the verb, the noun. I'm going to take you into Canaan. Canaan is your place of rest. The children of Israel entered Canaan, the place of rest, yet they did not experience rest. Why didn't they experience rest? Because they never believed God. They never exercised faith in what God said. And so we find them in Canaan, the place of rest, Fighting the enemies, they are fighting the Amalekites, the Hittites, the, the Jebusites, all the all the ites. They are just fighting, 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 fighting. While they are in the place of rest, they are fighting. And that is significant. And so Paul, Paul is making a point, and we, we cannot afford to miss the point. Paul is saying, you can be in the place of rest and not experience rest. Well, because the only prerequisite for rest is faith. Without faith, we oh my goodness. rest. Whoa. So look at this. Well, I'm, I'm, I'll come back to that later. Wow. Let's go to verse four. Let's go to verse four. Let's go to verse four. Paul then says, for he, and there is some debate among theologians whether the he here refers to God or to Joshua. I believe, I think it refers to Joshua. If I'm wrong, I'm, I'm willing to be corrected. Hey, you're right. <laughs> but I believe that he here speaks of Joshua because Joshua is the one instructing the children of Israel on behalf of God. Now, when, when Joshua speaks, God is speaking. So he says, whether it's God or Joshua, let's get the point. For he spake in a certain place. Now remember, in, in Hebrews chapters 3 and 4, towards the end of chapter 3, into, remember, we have to remember that the Bible wasn't written in, in chapters and verses. Right. The, they, they just wrote like it's a story. One long, long paragraph. It, it, is, it is later on that the Bible is divided into chapters and verses. So, so chapter 4 is a continuation of the thought in chapter 3. And in chapters three and four, Paul is focusing on the conversation that Joshua is having with the children of Israel as it relates to their entrance into Canaan and all that is happening there, all the episode, the saga that is happening there. So he spake in a certain place. He's talking to the children of Israel of the seventh day on this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his work. What is the significance of this? Connect, connect the dots. Remember, there is a difference between the seventh day and the Sabbath. Now, because the children of Israel, from the time they entered Canaan, even from their four parents who had died in the wilderness, they continued to, to, to the, the practice of unbelief. They continued the practice of not believing God and not accepting God by his word and not trusting in God's word and, and living by faith. They did not practice faith. And so Paul is saying, when I read this, this is what I'm, and this is the vibes that I'm getting. 
Paul is saying that when Joshua spoke to the children of Israel in the wilderness in Canaan, he could only mention the seventh day. He could not speak of a Sabbath. Because Sabbath means rest. And in order to rest, you have to exercise faith. But because the children of Israel are not exercising faith, all they have is the seventh day. Wow. 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 <laughs> repeat, repeat. Wow again. Repeat that again. Wow Can again. you repeat that, please? Yes. Repeat, please. The, 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 Christ prerequisite, the, the prerequisite for rest is what? Faith. Talk to me. Is what? Faith. Faith. Without faith, you cannot rest. That's right. Let, let, let's go back to verse 3. Let, let, let's go back to chapter 3, verse 19. Mm -hmm. So we see that they could not enter in. Enter into what? Verse 18 tells us, To whom swear he that they could not enter into his rest, but to them that did not believe. If you don't believe, if you don't have faith, you cannot enter into rest. Get what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that the children of Israel, the children of Israel were in Canaan, the place of rest. We've gone back to verse 8, chapter 4, verse 8. Paul is saying that the children of Israel were in Canaan, the place of rest, but they could not experience rest because they had no faith. So you can be in the place where you're supposed to experience rest. But if you do not exercise faith in God, in other words, if you are not trusting God, if you are not walking with God, if you are not in relationship with God, if you are not trusting God for forgiveness of sins, if, if God says to you that if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you, but you don't believe that, you cannot have rest and peace from your past mistakes. If God says, I have saved you, but you don't believe that, you won't experience salvation. Yeah. Because a relationship with God is based on a faith experience. So Paul makes the point that the children of Israel entered Canaan, the place of rest, yet they never experienced rest. They kept fighting, fighting the, all their enemies in a place where God had already promised them he was going to give them for free. Then he makes the point in verse 4. Since faith is the prerequisite for resting in God, if you have no faith, you cannot experience Sabbath. So Paul is saying that every time Joshua spoke to the children of Israel, all he could tell them about was the seventh day. They could not experience Sabbath. Because in order to experience Sabbath, Sabbath is rest. In order to experience Sabbath, you must have faith. So let me use Ellison's uh, example that he used tonight. If Ellison is not in relationship with Jesus, it doesn't matter how fast he runs from the supermarket on Friday afternoon before the sun goes down. All he is running to is church on the seventh day. He is not experiencing Sabbath if he does not walk with God, if he's not in relationship with God. That's it. That's really big and profound. Wow. Amen. So there are many of us as Seventh-day Adventists. All we do every week is go to church on the seventh day. We are not experiencing Sabbath. Because wow. Sabbath requires a faith encounter with God. Mm -hmm. What comes to me? Talk to me. But in addition to, in, in addition to that, uh, I mean, what you've said there is well in place. But to compound that, if you don't, if you're not worshiping the true God. 
then that even makes it worse because you go into a place, you're not experiencing the rest because you don't have faith. And the reason why you don't have faith is because you're not too sure what the true God is. If it's the God of the of the heathens or if it's the the one true God. No, that's I in hear. place. Yeah, yeah, that's in place. So look at this. Look at this. Paul then goes to verse 9. Let's go to verse 9. And, and Paul is making the point that as God's people on earth, there remains, therefore, a rest to the people of God. God's people have to rest. And, 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 and Paul has, I believe Paul has already made the point that just as the children of Israel were in Canaan, the place of rest, and they could not experience rest because rest does not come from a place. Get this. Get the, this is what Paul is actually saying. The true rest does not come from a place. Because they were from in a, the place. From a day? Say that. Or from a day? Well, that's where we're going. That's where we're going. Okay. That's where okay. we're going. So he establishes the point that rest cannot come from a place because they were in a place, in the place, Canaan, and could not experience rest. And Pastor Figo, he's making the point again. Rest does not come from the day. Because the children of Israel had the day, the seventh day, yet they could not experience rest. So he's saying, as God's people, we have to understand in verse 9 that there remains. Can we take care of that background noise there, Elder? Yes. Right. Thank on. you. So he's saying in verse 9, Hebrews 4 9, God's people have to understand that there remains a rest for the people of God. God's people have to rest. Let's go to verses 1 to 3. Okay. Hebrews Can I ask a question before, go before you go on. I, yeah, go I put it in the chat. Uh, but I think oh. at this point it is appropriate to ask it. Mm. Is the Sabbath then symbolic? Yes, it is. It is symbolic. And I'm, and I'm going to drive home that point okay. at the end. So if, if I don't drive it home hard enough, tell me. Sure. But we're gonna, that point is going to be made very clear. So in verses 1 to 3 of Hebrews 4, this is what Paul says. Let us therefore fear or be careful or be very careful. There's a promise being left us. That's the New Testament church is talking about, the New Testament believers. Let us, there be, let us therefore be careful, be very careful. There's a promise being left us of entering into his rest, that's God's rest. Any of us should seem to fall short of it or miss it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, the Old Testament believers, but the word that was preached to them did not benefit them because they did not mix what they heard with faith. In other words, what you hear, you must apply faith to it. So Paul is saying that was the mistake that they made. They did not walk by faith. For we which have believed, verse 3, for we which have believed do enter into rest. He's making that point very strong. He's, he's establishing the point that in order to rest, you must end, you must have faith. Faith is the prerequisite to take us into a rest experience with God. And then Paul applies the principle of the Old Testament place of rest. In Paul's theology, the norm is, 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 is right up there. The known aspect of rest is what the believer is supposed to grasp. The known aspect of rest is what the believer, is what the Holy Spirit is pointing the believer to, is what God is desirous of having us as believers to truly understand. And he, he, he brings that home in verses 14 to 16. Let's go there as we, as we prepare to wrap this up. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, now, this is the conclusion of the matter that Paul is, is, is making as it relates to rest and faith. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, 
let us hold fast our profession. And this is the combination, this is the relationship between Sabbath and the sanctuary. For we have a great high priest, we have not a great high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, and we know what a double negative in a, in a sentence means, it's a positive. Yeah. We have a high priest who yeah. is touched and who is tempted, he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Where is that high priest? Where is that high priest? Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. That high priest is in heaven. So let us come boldly to a place that we may obtain mercy and find help in time of need. Paul is saying the, the, the rest that God wants us to comprehend as believers is found in a place. That place is where Jesus is. It is built on a relationship with Jesus who resides now in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. Let's encounter Jesus by faith. Who is in, in, who is in heaven interceding on our behalf. Here again, God invites us to encounter Jesus where he is in heaven. And look at the result. The result is found in verse 10, I believe. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 10. For he that is entered into God's rest, and the only way to enter into God's rest is by faith or through faith. He also have ceased from his works of sin. Now, this is the point, Pastor Figo. This is the point that you, you were pointing out just now. Any person who has entered into God's rest, and the only prerequisite for entering into God's rest is a faith relationship with Jesus. So the person who has entered into God's rest by encountering Jesus who is in heaven, that person has ceased from his own works. What works are these? What are our own works? Well, as human beings, we only have one kind of work, which is sin. Unbelief, which leads to sin. Anything that is not of faith is sin. So Paul is saying, when a sinner encounters Jesus through faith, God leads him into a holy life. God leads him to experience victory. God leads him to walk by faith, to live a powerful Christian experience, to the point of overcoming sin in his life. And Paul says that can only happen when that believer encounters Jesus by faith. And I believe this is, this is what uh, Matthew, Jesus in Matthew uh, eleven twenty eight says. Come unto me. I've heard Pastor figure of this already. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The word rest here in, Hebrew, in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 means repose or refresh. I will give, come unto me and I will give you a refreshing. How do we go to Jesus by faith? Come unto me and I will give you repose, rest from sin, a refreshing. This is the very same word that describes what happened to God when work was ended. Exodus chapter 31 verse 17. The Sabbath is a sign. We can use the word symbol, Pastor Fico. What do you want? The Sabbath is a sign of what? Of what God wants to do in the believer when he encounters Jesus by faith. So look at this. It is a sign. Well, let's get to the word refresh first. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and the earth. And on the seventh day, the Lord rested and was refreshed. The word refreshed in here in the Hebrew text of Exodus 31, 17 has the very same meaning as is found in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come unto me and I will give you a refreshing. The very experience of God on the seventh day is what he wants to reproduce in the life of the believer who walks by faith. A refreshing, a repose from sin, a delivery from sin. So look at this. This is this is this is this is the concept of the Sabbath that righteousness by faith presents to us. When the believer ceases from work, that's what the, the, Sabbath, the Sabbath commandment says: thou shalt not do any work. When the believer ceases from work, from his manual labor, whatever he has to do that he was doing during the week and he ceases his work on the seventh day, and he's resting from manual labor. He's resting from his regular work. 
It is a symbol or a sign of what God wants to do in the life of the believer to give him a deliverance and a cessation from sin. So that is why if someone is not in relationship with Jesus, if someone is not walking by faith, his cessation from regular work on the seventh day does not mean Sabbath. Ah. You, we must have faith in God for the Sabbath to become the sign, an external sign. The Sabbath is an external sign of what God is doing inside the believer. A deliverance from sin. A resting in the assurance of God. In other words, as a believer, we have to be sure, we have to know that we are saved. We have to know that we are in relationship with Jesus Christ. We have to know that we are covenanting with God, that we are walking in a relationship with God. And every Sabbath, we celebrate with God our daily Christian experience. That is why it's not a problem for people to call us seven days, because seven days a week, we should be walking in holiness. We are not holy on Sabbath. We are holy every day because we are walking in holiness with God. And on Sabbath, we, we celebrate that encounter with God. So may God truly bless our hearts. May God speak to our hearts. May we experience true Sabbath rest, which takes place. Amen which takes place in relationship with Jesus and which is manifested and, and, and signed in our weekly encounter on Sabbath. May we truly have a faith experience with Jesus. This is my desire for every one of us here tonight, that we truly have a faith encounter with Jesus Christ. May God bless us in the mighty way. Thank you. God bless. Pastor, Pastor Peter's... Thank yeah. you so much for the presentation. Can I ask you to tie your shoes? Because <laughs> questions, questions are coming your way. Put on your, yeah. put on your shoes, but put on your, um, <laughs> your pads and everything else. A wonderful presentation. I, I, I was blessed, certainly blessed by it. I mean, I, I felt the, the, the living water, you know, flowing in my direction. And I really wish that others. Um, were drinking just as much as I was, just as I was, it was a blessing. So the, the floor is not open to questions. I have a couple myself, but I'm going to just open the floor to anyone who has questions. I have a comment. Or who want to say anything on the presentation, you can do that right now. Leonard, is it you I heard? I, I, I'm first. Oh, innocent. I'm first. Innocent. I'm first. Um, Pastor Peters. Yes, sir. I'm not telling you thank you. <laughs> I am not telling you I appreciate it. I'm telling you it was too short. <laughs> I have it. <laughs> it was too short. I find. What, what, I, what, what I, that? that? So she she so find that too. I I think I have I have acclimatized to preaching on Zoom for short. Right, and yeah, and yeah. and we. And you've come into an arena where we were accustomed of doing these um, long-winded things. So, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, we are. But it's just a light <laughs> moment. It's just a light yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It tells, it tells how intense that was, thought processing. And you said certain things there that had me thinking. And, and uh, I have questions, but I will come in later. And I thank God for using you. And it's the first time I heard, apart from figure and myself speaking to one another, I have heard another human being presented um, um, the Sabbath in that light. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I wish, and I, I know Shano, Shanika is blessed, figure. Uh, yes, uh, those thoughts were definitely mine as well. Uh, which, 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 which makes me want to ask, Pastor. Mm -hmm. I mean, I am itching to ask a question. Yeah. 
I believe someone has come to know Christ and accept him as their savior. And um, the person currently is employed. They are attached to some, you know, some work that, um, on which they work on Sabbath. But having accepted Christ as their savior, is it possible for them to enter into an experience of rest, even though they have not yet begun to, how you say, keep? I use the word keep based yeah. on how we understand it to observe yeah. the Sabbath. That, that's what I'm asking. Um, that 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 answer, that question has a perfect answer. And like I said, when I began, this is a series, this is a sermon in a series on the sanctuary. And because of conversations we've had before, I took out some, I took out three statements from Ellen White. But this, this, so allow me, allow me to use um, two statements from Ellen White. One from early writings, if anybody wants the exact um, thing, I could give it to them. And one from the great controversy, where she says two things. One. God has children who do not see and keep the Sabbath. They have not rejected it. They have just not seen the light of it. And then she says, no, God will not judge anyone concerning the Sabbath who has not had a chance to understand it clearly. Now, if, if we understand what Paul is saying in Hebrews chapter 4, Paul is saying that true rest comes, comes from an encounter with Jesus Christ. The sinner must encounter Jesus before he encounters the seventh day or even the seventh day Sabbath. Mm. It is Jesus who gives rest and the Sabbath is a sign of that. So there are many believers. Now look at this. Let, let, let's, let's draw the comparison here. There are many people who go to church on the seventh day who are not resting because they do not know Jesus as their personal savior. They do not have okay. a faith encounter with Jesus. It means the opposite is true. There are people who have a faith encounter with Jesus who do not know the Sabbath or the seventh day Sabbath. Yes, they are resting in Christ. Yes, they are walking by faith in Christ. And as soon as they understand the truth of the seventh day, how it is a sign of what the, in other words, the Sabbath is a sign of what you already have, which is rest in Christ. Oh, you already have it, yeah. You already have that rest in Christ, and the Sabbath is a sign of that. So as some, and that is why I, I say this all the time to, to, to the church members. When as Seventh-day Adventists, we, we do evangelism and we do witnessing, our witnessing to a Pentecostal or a Baptist cannot be the same as when we witness to an unsaved person. As Seventh-day Adventists, we, we have the bad habit of treating everybody as though they are not saved. But the person, a, a Baptist or a Pentecostal or somebody who is already walking in Christ, who have a faith relationship with Christ, what we have to say to them concerning the Sabbath is this is a sign that you already have. In other words, let, let, let me draw an example here. I, I hope it, 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 it fits into what we want to say. There, 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 there might be a, a lady who goes to, to Tong, what, what is your expensive jewelry in, in, in jewelry store in, in Castries? That's one can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can answer that. I I know it is it is it is little Switzerland and taking Barbados. <laughs> so a, a woman might go to an expensive jewelry store and buy a wedding band and put it on her finger and walk around with the sign. But she, she doesn't have a man. Okay. Wow. But she's okay. not married. She's not married. She's not married. She doesn't have a man, but she, she has, has a, a sign. She's deceiving people. So the, the Sabbath is the sign that we are in relationship with the man, Christ Jesus. There are folk who are in relationship with Jesus, but they have not yet understood the sign okay. of that relationship. So and that's why both in, in Exodus and in Ezekiel, the Bible is, is the Bible writers are very careful to say that the Sabbath is a sign now, of now our relationship with Jesus Christ. 
Yes. You open another question now. Hmm. With the same analogy that you draw, she has the ring and she do, she's not married. Hmm. Can she be married and don't have the ring? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So there are people who are married in relationship with Jesus, but they don't have the signs. Okay. The sound. All right. God, God, in other words, God wants to fix both situations. Okay. God wants to okay. fix both situations. Does he want to fix both situations? Does he need to fix both situations? Well, if, if we're going to truly experience holiness and righteousness while we are walking here on earth, yes, it has to be because it is a faith encounter with God. That faith encounter with God has to lead us to the point of truth where we all, in other words, when Jesus comes back, he's coming back for every for, for our people who have all things in common. Jesus is not coming back for different groups of people. This gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world for a witness. Is he coming back for people with the sign or people who has the real thing? By the time Jesus comes back, I believe, and, and I could be wrong, but from what I've studied from the scriptures, uh, when, we, when we go to uh, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, the list of gifts, he gave some of this, these different gifts for the edifying of the body of Christ till we come to the unity of the faith. So the Bible makes it clear, God is coming back for a people, a church that is without spot and wrinkle. We gotta have, we gotta get things right. So I believe with all my heart that when Jesus comes back, everyone who, every believer would understand the sign. That, that's my, that's my personal view. Okay. Based on what I've studied in scripture. I respect that. Leonard. Go ahead, Leonard, with your question. Baraka. Leonard, you, I see your hand raised. I hope you haven't fallen asleep on us. Unmute and go ahead. All right. Um, anybody else has a question while we wait for Leonard? I see his mic is doing one thing or the other. I uh, show you have a question. Who is that? Zilfa. <laughs> Let me see. I have one too. One uh, is done. Funky, you, you sound far, eh? you know the usual. Yeah, I said I have one too. Right. right ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ah, uh -huh, yes. Okay. Pastor Peters, you also mentioned, you said about um, the same analogy you were using earlier on concerning the person who, you said that the person who is, well, the one whereby they were in the ring, but they're not married, um, deceiving persons. Mm -hmm. You believe um, with that case, because there are a lot of people who attend, who believe the Sabbath, and they have to go to church every Saturday, and of those who go every Sunday believe that they, they have to do that, and they're just doing it for doing sick right um do do you believe that that um even even as they're trying god is still trying to get close to them and even though it seems as if that they're deceiving persons because it is like i'm just going to church for going to church sick because i want everybody to believe that i'm holy do you believe these persons also um they are also given the 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 privilege of you know, being saved, I, I, like, does God hold that against them? That's really and truly what I want to ask. No, he doesn't. In time of ignorance, in time of ignorance, God winks. So when I, when I made the statement that they are deceiving people, it was, not, it was not meant that they are actually deceiving people in a deliberate, deceptive way. It means that they are, they are, they are not in what they're supposed to be doing. That, that's, that's the way I meant it. You want to get so, the, yes. true, the true picture. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we see, that's why the Bible says we, we only see the outward. We see the outward demonstration of religion. An outward demonstration of religiosity. That's what we see. And so when someone performs their religious actions, that is what the Pharisees were, were, were good at. And Jesus mm -hmm. condemned them all the time. 
they, they had the outward performance of religious actions and religious religiosity, but they had no encounter with God. If they had an encounter with God, they would not have killed Jesus. They would not have given up, given Jesus up uh, to be crucified. So, yes, there are many people who are performing religious, and, and they, are, they are sincere about it. They think that what they're doing is right. The Bible makes it clear, in time of ignorance, God wings at, but he is saying to us who know the truth, I want you to present the truth to those people. And that includes us as Seventh-day Adventists. There are many Christians or Seventh-day Adventists who do not see the Sabbath in the, in the context of righteousness by faith. In fact, many times when we preach, and, and Pastor Figo can testify to that, when we preach the Sabbath, particularly in Crusades, we present it as that, that which you're supposed to do. But the Sabbath is not just about what we're supposed to do, not just actions, but it's a now which points to an encounter with Jesus Christ. So the, more important than just going to church on Saturday is a, is a living faith experience with God. That's the point that Paul is making here in uh, Hebrews chapters 3 and 4. Yes. Um, Pastor Jason and, and others, good evening. Evening, sir. I was, yes. I was going to line you up, Pudicus, but um, <laughs> okay, so, because I have Zil and Anthony Prince right ahead of you. So okay, let's sorry. take them since their hands were raised. Zil uh, Anthony Prince, and then Udicus. All right. Follow protocol. No problem. <laughs> Social distance. <laughs> Zil go ahead. Zil Fatiara, your question. Unmute your mic. All right, uh, Anthony. Yes, good night, everyone. I want to commend as an astounding presentation. I was spellbound because I found information that I never knew. But in reality, when you learn the Bible, it makes sense to me. Now, my question is that he's talking about righteousness by faith and we must believe what God says. Now, when we look at the whole situation, suppose I believe in God, but I do not believe in his son. How does that impact your presentation on righteousness by faith? Since it is a rest in Jesus that, that, that you're really pointing us to. As a matter of fact, rest comes through Jesus, through rest, through faith. Amen. And it is only through Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father but by me. There is no other name under heaven given whereby we must be saved. When, when God was taking the children of Israel into Canaan, he changed it, and Joshua's name to Joshua from Hosea to Joshua. So when, when those parallels are understood, in other words, Canaan, and that's why we speak of the heavenly Canaan, we are going to a heavenly Canaan. Mm. So the earthly Canaan is a symbol of the heavenly Canaan. Mm. And it is only Joshua that can take you to Canaan. Mm. And Joshua represents Jesus. Mm. And so even in the earthly Canaan, we see that it is Joshua or Jesus who had to lead them. And, and of course, the Old Testament Joshua is a figure of the New Testament Joshua, Jesus Christ. So... If someone does not understand that they are saved through Jesus and Jesus alone, then they have not yet understood the gospel. They have not yet understood the gospel. And, and that, was Paul's, that was Paul's greatest challenge with the Judaizers. Mm -hmm. They thought that they were in relationship with God, but they did not know Jesus. And Paul has to say to them over and over, salvation is Jesus. Mm -hmm. It is through Jesus and Jesus alone. There is no other salvation other than Jesus. There is no other salvation. There is no other righteousness other than Jesus. So righteousness by faith means faith in the righteousness of God, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus alone is our righteousness. So if someone does not understand that, then it is our responsibility as ambassadors of the kingdom of God to help them to understand those truths. Yes, and my last question. So therefore, a lot of the things that, that, that are drilled into your head, don't do this, don't do that, don't cook, don't do etc. Some of those things can, from what you are saying, some of those things really and truly the, the, the import that is attached to them are only 
for example, promoting salvation by works. Definitely. As long as they are not putting their proper perspective. In other words, the, the, in the statement earlier said, I, I said this, we have understood Sabbath as a verb, mm -hmm. but Sabbath as a noun. Mm -hmm. We are having difficulty with that. So even, even some of us as, as preachers and teachers and pastors, what we present to people is, is Sabbath as a verb. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And so when, when, when a believer comes into Adventism or any other Sabbath denomination, because Adventists are not the only persons who keep Sabbath, we, 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 we treat Sabbath as the day that we don't do certain things, which is not Sabbath keeping. Sabbath keeping is a sign of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And Paul, is, Paul has to hammer that home to the New Testament church. He says to them, the Old Testament believers missed it. The Old Testament church missed it. And they could not enter into rest. If we make the same mistake, we will miss it too. We will miss the rest that, that, that is going to take place in Canaan if our focus is not on Jesus Christ. That is, that is a I'd warning like a brief that he comment. sends to the church. Sorry, go ahead, Pastor. I'd like to make a brief comment on um, Anthony's question regarding the knowledge of the, or the acceptance of the Son of God. Okay. Um, in, the, in, in Romans chapter 9, very beautiful chapter, um, Paul explains why, why the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness were able to attain to righteousness. That is the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, did not attain to the law of righteousness. And he, and he says why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. Then he adds, they stumbled at that stumbling stone. The scripture says, behold, I lay in Zion, a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. And whoever yes. believes on him, on him will not be put to shame. The Jews stumbled on the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul said that um, the preaching of the cross and the preaching of Christ mm. was to the Greeks foolishness. And to the Jews, it became a stumbling block. And so the Jews were very knowledgeable. They knew quite well and they claimed through their prayers and the, their other religious activities, their belief in the one true God. They were firm on that. But they did not accept. They stumbled over the matter of the sonship of Jesus Christ. They crucified him because he, he, he dared to make himself <laughs> equal with God by saying, I am the son of God. Yeah. yeah. And so that can be a stumbling block, block, um, stone for many people as well. It can prevent them from entering into God's rest, day notwithstanding, yeah. whatever day of the week they observe as the Sabbath, the, the matter of the sonship of Jesus Christ can be to them a stumbling stone. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so Jesus has to become central to our teaching, particularly in evangelism. He has to become central. Amen. Amen. Zilfa, are you ready for your with your question? Yes, I'm sorry. I was having some technical difficulties. Okay, <laughs> but um, thank you, Pastor Peters. Okay, Pastor Figo, you mentioned um, the Apostle Paul. I need some help understanding Romans 3, 5. From me or um, from Pastor Peters? From Pastor Peters. Okay. Because okay. I'm wondering if it means that, okay, righteousness is not dependent on what we do, but it's something that we receive. Um, the next part, um, it's like when Pastor Peters was talking, the little light bulb went on, rest as a verb and rest as a noun. So, Rest as a verb, on the seventh day, God rested. Action with Genesis 2. And as a noun, Hebrews 4 talks about entering into God's rest. That's something, that's a noun. Mm -hmm. but why did God place so much emphasis on one day? So is the Sabbath was because, if the Sabbath is because God rested on the seventh day, why did he rest? 
Okay. And the other okay. part of the question, how can, if righteousness is dependent on faith, how can a person who is saved by grace through faith alone keep the Sabbath holy? Okay. All right, the first one, why did God give the Sabbath? Basically, that's what you're asking? The first one was Romans 3, 5. Oh. Let's see. Romans 3, 5. It says, Romans chapter 3, verse 5, but if our unrighteousness, that is it? Yes. But if our unrighteousness commends the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who take a vengeance? I speak as a man. Paul is talking about the, in, in line with what um, Pastor Figo is saying. Many times we, we think that it is our goodness, our righteousness, uh, our good deeds that, that make us right with God. But Paul is establishing the point that everyone is unrighteous. There is none righteous, no, not one. So he's saying that unless we, unless we acknowledge our nothingness, unless we acknowledge our unrighteousness, we cannot magnify the righteousness of God. So the word, the word commend in the Greek in verse 5 is actually show, to show or to demonstrate. So that is what he's saying. Our unrighteousness show or expose the righteousness of God. And, and that goes back to the Laodicean message where Jesus is saying, buy from me gold tried in the fire, white raiment, which is his righteousness. Unless we acknowledge our nothingness, unless we acknowledge our unrighteousness, we cannot appreciate the righteousness of God. So Paul is actually saying in verse 5 of Romans chapter 3, that our nothingness, our uncleanness, our unrighteousness, when we acknowledge that, it magnifies and it shows how righteous God is. Uh, the second question, I hope that um, satisfies you. Want to add anything to that, Pastor? Um, no, you can go ahead. All right, the second question was what again? Can someone who is walking by faith and who is in relationship with Jesus Christ, how does that person keep the Sabbath? Yes. yes. Not that one, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Now, when, when, you, when we go back to the Sabbath commandment, in the Sabbath commandment in Exodus chapter 20, God is speaking of actions. But we know that the Sabbath commandment is not just about actions. It's about the null. It's about relationship with God. Now, out of that relationship with God, out of that encounter with God, God is saying to us, the things that I'm asking you not to do, the regular work, the regular things that you do from the first day to the sixth day, from Sunday to, to Friday, those regular things that you do, those the secular things that you do, your secular job, your mundane things, I want you to cease from those things, to focus on me. That experience is a sign, a sign of what God is doing through you and in you throughout the week. God is calling us to cease from sin. And that is an everyday encounter. So when God finished his work, when God finished his work, by the way, there is another aspect of the Sabbath and righteousness by faith. Let me share, let me share this with you. Picture this, picture this, picture this. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. God worked. From the first day, we're talking about creation week. God worked from the first day of the week to the sixth day. And then he rested. On what day of the week did God create Adam and Eve? Anybody? On the sixth day. The Bible doesn't say exactly when on the sixth day. But we have an idea based on all the other things that happened on day number six. There is the idea given, and Pastor Figo, if I'm wrong, you tell me. There is the idea given that Adam and Eve were created towards the end of the sixth day. Am I right? All right. Towards mm -hmm. the end of the sixth day. Okay? The only thing we know that God told Adam to do was to name the animals. Name the animals. Now look at this. The next, the first, the very first full day the very first full day a day begins when the sun goes down 
and it lasts for 24 hours. The very first full day of the existence of Adam and Eve is which day? The seventh. The seventh day Sabbath. At creation week, at the end of creation week, that first Sabbath, what were Adam and Eve doing? What were we supposed to do on the Sabbath? Is, is that a trick there, question? I'm asking a question. The, the, reason, the reason why I think there is a pause. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, because, animals. it's because um, I think many people have come to realize or think that um, it was not a Sabbath yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah we, we discussed that before. We discussed right. that it before. It wasn't a Sabbath. Yeah. Right. It wasn't a Sabbath yet. Okay. But Adam and Eve, what are they doing? Because what was God doing on that seventh day? Resting. He was resting. Mm -hmm. So we can assume, we can assume with, with almost certainty that Adam and Eve are also resting with him. All right. They, 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 this is not, this is not uh, uh, an unbiblical assumption. <laughs> the, the Bible doesn't say it. But the Bible tells us God is resting on that day. We know that the Sabbath is not created yet. The Sabbath is declared at the end of the seventh day. But okay. the, we can assume that they are doing the action of resting. I would, I would, I would like to decline on that though. In what in honeymoon? What honeymoon. I decline oh. too. Oh. <laughs> I have, a, I have, a, I have, a, I have a question. The honeymoon. All right. Let, let, let me make the point, and then we're gonna come back to that. All right, let's say, for argument's sake. No, no, this is the point. This is the point. Not an argument. This is the point. Adam and Eve begin their existence mm -hmm. with an encounter of rest with God. Mm -hmm. um, they really are. They are not resting. Now, look at this. Adam and Eve are not resting from work because they have not done any work. In spite of right. what Ellison said. So, so get, get the point. The honeymoon wasn't work. So Adam and Eve, get the point. The point that I'm making is this. God has to work and then rest. Yeah. But as human beings, we have to rest and then work. Which is the principle of righteousness by faith. The very first thing that God wants the Christian to do is learn to rest in him. If we do not get that right, our faith encounter with God, which is the rest. If we do not get right, our faith encounter with God, nothing else is important. Nothing else matters. So all our commandment keeping, all our Sabbath keeping, all our tithe returning, all the things that we do from a religious point of view have no salvation significance unless we experience a rest in God. A little bit. A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Okay, so, so this goes back to the why of the Sabbath. God gave the Sabbath and, and both Exodus and Ezekiel drives home, drive home the point as a sign of our encounter with God, he is the one who is making us holy. So the Sabbath is a sign of our holy walk with God. That which we do every Sabbath, cessation from work means we are involved in holy activities. Those holy activities that are demonstrated on Sabbath is a, are a demonstration of our holy walking with Christ every day of the week. And that's why, that's why unless you understand this, Sabbath does not have the, 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 the significance that it is supposed to have. Because we live any old hall during the week, we live in sin, we, we curse, we fuss, we, we all sorts of things. And on Sabbath, we expect an automatic holiness. It, it doesn't work that way. We have to be walking with God every day. And the Sabbath is, a, is, is in other words, let, let me use another marriage analogy. Those of us who are married in here, uh, and let me use this from the point of view of a, of, a, of a lady. 
if your husband is nice to you only when your anniversary comes or your birthday, let's say your birthday or your, or your anniversary, doesn't matter. Mm. When your anniversary comes, your husband buys all these flowers and, and chocolate, um, gluten chocolate, and all these nice things and, 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 and hotel and, and, and all, he, he, he goes out. But he does that only on, 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 on your birthday, on, on your anniversary. But during the rest of, of the year, he treats you like a dog. No, 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 I love you, no kiss, no, no, nothing, no little pat on the back, no, no niceties. That is how some of us treat God. We only know him on Sabbath. We only nice to God on Sabbath. And we think that we are keeping the Sabbath holy by doing that. But holy Sabbath keeping is a demonstration of our holy living. And unless us, as, as Christians and as Seventh-day Adventists in particular, we understand that, we will continue to, to present the Sabbath to others as a do. A do. It is not a do. It is a living experience. Amen. All right. Let me see if I can take the hands. Eudicus is supposed to follow. Eudicus. And then Leonard has a question in the chat that I would address after Eudicus. And then we'll have Lawrence Chase. So Eudicus, come through. Yes. Uh, good evening again, everyone. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Pastor Jason, I, 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 just, I just get it. The, with this presentation, it, was, it really captivated me. And um, I see some things like, um, and I am somewhat puzzled about it sometimes, where the usual, the usual, the pattern of, of service every Saturday, that um, it's more bent into a program, 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 and not the real encounter with Christ. Yeah. I, I have a problem with that because it is too much, too bent on that program and if you do as if you don't keep the program you deviate from the Sabbath. I don't know if you 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 all can 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 share with that. Well it, it, it is a burden it is a burden on my heart as well. I've spoken to I've spoken about that a number of times even to my churches. Um and, and this this goes back to, to to the traditional concept of Sabbath observance that we have created as Seventh-day Adventists. That if we don't do certain things on Saturday, we are not keeping the Sabbath. And, and it has become religion. It, it has become a religious requirement. But true Sabbath is, is an encounter with God. And Jesus, Jesus had the same issue with the Pharisees. He, he walked through the cornfield with his, with his disciples and they broke some corn. And the, the they, they, they condemn him and they condemn the, 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 the disciples for doing that. Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath. They condemned him. Jesus did certain things on the Sabbath and he was condemned because it didn't fit into the, the traditional requirement of what Sabbath should be. And, and, and we, are, we are making the same mistake. And it goes back to a lack of understanding of the, of the principles of righteousness by faith when it comes to Sabbath. It is about relationship with God. That is what the Sabbath is about. Relationship with God. But we have, we have created structures which, which we say to ourselves, Sabbath keeping is this. And if you don't do this, you are not keeping Sabbath. And we have a classic example right before us. When, when COVID came and we had to shut down, the biggest problem on the mind of Adventists is what are we going to do on Sabbath? I can tell you because I'm the pastor who was bombarded. Yes, sir. Pastor, what are we going to do? <laughs> you don't know what to do on Sabbath, just between you and God? <laughs> we, we are anxious to get back into the four walls because that is what Sabbath keeping is. I had a sad experience of, of, of a member saying to me, that we sh they don't think that the, the, the church should be used as a hurricane shelter anymore because what if a hurricane comes on Friday and people have to go to the, to the church on Saturday? Really? It's a sanctuary. That's what it is. <laughs> the, the, the people who come there, they will not be keeping Sabbath. I say, no, they will be sheltering from a hurricane. That's right. 
so so when when we when we have those kind of things in our heads it it it, it doesn't lend to relationship and 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 the sweetness of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a sweet experience with God. It's a weekly honeymoon with God. It's a joy, a delight. That is what God is saying. It's a delight. But it cannot be a delight if your focus is on the do's and don'ts. It's a delight when your focus is on the man, Christ Jesus. That's what it's about. Pastor, may I say something? Yeah, man. Ask a question. You, you, you are saying... <laughs> You're saying that our relationship, that the relationship should be a relationship. The Sabbath is with God, but explain that because some people feel um, having that relationship with God is going to the temple on Saturday and worship. That's all they think is having a relationship with God, going to the temple to worship. When I read the Gospels, I see something totally different. Definitely. Jesus. Yeah. The Bible says, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath. But examine what Jesus did on that Sabbath, on those Sabbaths. He went in there to read the scripture, and then he went out. Jesus didn't sit down all day in the temple, in the synagogue. He went all over the place preaching and teaching and healing and, and, and relieving the plight of, of, of people. That is Sabbath, relieving the plight of people who are, who are burdened, who are suffering physically from, from whatever issues they have in life and spiritually under the burden of sin. So our concept of Sabbath worship today needs to drastically change. Very much so. Very much so. Because if, I mean from young, even now it's hard for... So, um, it, it, not now, now, but like I said, two years ago, it was hard for me to break away from church. Going Sabbath is not going to church. Sabbath keeping is not going to church. So that might be a part of it, mm. but that it's not even a major part of it because. And I guess that the majority, I want to say, I'm subject to correction, but I want to say the majority of Christians do not understand what worship is or what Sabbath keeping, observance, Sabbath observance is. And if you take away the temple, they can't keep the Sabbath. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, have, we, have, we have structured and denominationalized relationship with God. It can only happen within a structure. That, that is what we say to people. Your relationship with God can only function within this. And if you go outside of that, you violate it. And, and that is why with God, the emphasis is the norm, the place that encounter with Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, that has to be the function. That has to be the focus. And everything else will fall in place. So if you had to give us advice now, as Sabbath keepers, how would you, I don't know if this is an unfair question, but how would what would you advise us to do? How should we step about observing the Sabbath or observing the rest of the Sabbath? All right. I mean, to, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. In a practical way, yeah. so that even 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 the little children can understand this is what God expects of Sabbath observance. It begins with an understanding of what the Sabbath means, and and it goes back to what we looked at tonight. The Sabbath means relationship with God. It is a sign of our relationship with God, that Jehovah is our creator, he is our redeemer, and he's our sanctifier. He's the one who's making us holy. That is, is key. It is crucial to Sabbath observance. Now that we understand this, these are the things that Jehovah is saying uh, we need to cease from doing, and these are the things that we need to do on Sabbath. Look at the things that Jesus did on Sabbath. There was fellowship with the believers, there was preaching, teaching, healing, 
finding people who, 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 are, who are dying, who are burdened, there was and not leading there. them, pointing them to Jesus, demonstrating Jesus to them. There was not fellowship with the believers. They were um, not. They were not believers. Well, yeah, yeah, understood. Understood the context. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, there, there is a place for 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 church attendance. What percentage of of the time of the twenty four hours? What percentage of that is spent in church? The Sabbath is twenty four hours. We go to church for five hours. Five hours cannot be Sabbath keeping. But 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 you see, keeping Sabbath. First of all, we have to understand Abraham, the father of faithful. Did he ever keep? Did the Bible ever say Abraham kept the Sabbath by by not doing this, by not doing that, by not doing this? And the answer is no, he did not. He, Abraham did not have those laws. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But Abraham was a believer in God. Why did Abraham descendants now get those laws? And that is where I see a righteousness by faith in Abraham. Because I read some here, if the descendants of Abraham had believed like their father Abraham, they would have no need for Mount Sinai. Yeah, yeah. No, if there was no, no, no Mount Sinai, there would not have been, in it you shall do no work. It would not have that. Because God wanted to teach the children of Israel the rest in God that Abraham understood. Not on a day, but today we still asking how should we keep the Sabbath? Because we still fisticated upon the sign, which the sign was to teach something, as you rightly said, Joshua point to another day, Joshua point to that rest. The ultimate rest in Jesus Christ. So when we accept Jesus Christ, that is keeping the Sabbath. Is not in your going to church. A matter of fact, you do, one do not have to go to church. And that is where I like to answer people straight. One do not have to set foot in no church in order to keep a Sabbath. You don't have to do that. And we have to tell people that, okay? Because Sabbath is in Christ. And whenever one or one, one, one or wherever one or two are gathered in my name, I am in the midst to bless. And we have to get away from that colonization thinking that we have to gather some here. Amen. Okay. And, and because that is a double whammy, Pastor, um, Pastor Peters, of, of righteousness by faith. Because it doesn't add up that, because first of all, Jesus custom. We have to take that in connection that Jesus had to keep the Sabbath according to the law. He had to because he was under the law. That custom was before the cross. And that's why I said that he did not go to church with believers. Because the same people that was there did not believe in him, so they could not be believers. He go, he went to the temple with law keepers. Yeah, and get you, get you. He kept the law. So that was his custom. A lot of seven day Adventists now use that to say, well, Jesus did that. Guess what? 
There's a lot of other ritual practices that Jesus kept before the cross. I think I made the point. I hear. Yeah, there, there, there are um, a lot of extreme. Let, let me just say this quick. There are a lot of extremes that that many people go to in terms of the Sabbath and righteousness by faith. Um, we, we we can we we go to one extreme in terms of the do's and don'ts, and then we go to another extreme. Another extreme that we've gone to within even within Adventism is since in the context of righteousness by faith. May I add? Since the Sabbath points to relationship with Jesus Christ and Jesus is, is the true rest of faith, people have gone to the extreme where they say we no longer need the seventh day Sabbath because our rest is in Jesus Christ. This is an extreme. If our, our rest is in Jesus Christ, why do we still have to keep Sabbath? And how can you prove that's an extreme? Because it, it goes outside of the out of the outside of the principles of biblical theology. In other words, ah. the Sabbath ah. is a it sign is of the sanctifying power. Are we together? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. So Ezekiel, Exodus, make it clear that the Sabbath is a sign of God's sanctifying power over his people. Over the as trail. long as God is the sanctifier, the Sabbath is a sign. And it says yes. throughout... But so the question we could ask is this, is God still sanctifying us right now? Is God still the sanctifier right now? The answer is yes. So the principle of the signage is still applicable. Um, right. can I let, me see if I can, let me see if I can get through a couple of the questions that were pending. Um, hey, listen, if you don't, if you don't mind. Um, well, I think Pastor almost answered that, but, but Leonard said, Dill, Raslav argues that the Sabbath and the law find their fulfillment in Christ. If Sabbath is a sign of the sanctifying work of the Spirit of Christ in the life of the believer, how necessary is the actual keeping of a day, which is just a sign of the work of the Spirit of Christ in the life of the believer? I almost said it as Leonard would have said it. Yeah. Okay. Nice. <laughs> That's a nice question. Yes. Just like every other external Sabbath. performance. In other words, that all week. Jesus is the sinner's righteousness. Why does the sinner, the blood of Jesus is what cleanses us from sin, right? Why does, why does the sinner have to go to the watery grave of baptism? Right. If Jesus, if Jesus' blood is what cleanses us from sin, why does the sinner have to go to the watery grave of baptism? The watery grave of baptism is a sign. It's an outward sign of an internal experience. By the way, what? according to the principles of righteousness by faith, someone needs to be saved first in relationship with Jesus first, washed by the blood first before they are baptized in water. That's, that's righteousness by faith. Mm. So the, the same thing applies to the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a sign of our encounter with God. Now that you're walking with God, you don't get rid of the sign because it is still a sign. It's a, it's, 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 it's a weekly reminder of, 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 of the principle of the kingdom of God, of that rest. So when, when the children of Israel entered Canaan, the resting place, they did not get rid of the sign of rest. There was still a Sabbath and there was still the Sabbaths plural, pointing to the rest, although they were in the place. So coming into the place does not mean the sign is taken away. And the same thing applies to the New Testament church after the death of Christ. He is still our sanctifier and the sign is still an appropriate uh, demonstration of what is happening in the life, inside the life of the believer. And, and that's, that's how I could explain it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you, 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 you're making that point because I like to, I asked a question earlier on about the symbolism of the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. I like to differentiate between something that is typical and something that is symbolic. Um, types, when types met their fulfillment, they were done away with. Right. You know, they were replaced. Symbols, however, salvation symbols 
um, you know, although I have not studied that completely, but to me, salvation symbols tend to remain. Yeah, yeah. Right? They are symbolic. They tend to remain as a constant reminder of something that God is doing, that God wants to do. Right? Um, you know, so it, it, it does not, the symbol does not die when one, when one meets Christ. He continues to experience the symbol um, if he does not continue in an experience of Christ, as we've been talking about faith and belief, then that symbol is meaningless. It's meaningless. That symbol yes. is worthless. Yeah. But the symbol um, has life. It has substance. It takes wings. It, it has blood when one is in Christ. Yes. And so Sabbath is a, is a rich, rewarding experience when a person knows Christ. Amen. I, Amen. I just want to add that. Nice, nice, nice. I like that. Um, Lawrence Chase. There was a hand up and then Brother Corey and then Lloyd. I'll go in that order. Lawrence Chase, if you... Yes, yeah, yes please. Um, sure. Pastor Peter, I would like to um, thank you very much for um, the presentation. Yes. Well, it was indeed um, enlightening, right? And I believe that um, the angle of which the angle which you took um, in presenting the Sabbath that we should um, when we present the Sabbath that we should um, take that angle in presenting it to non-believers etc. Doing it in churches whatever right. Um, however, um, there is a, um, a question that I uh, I want to take you back. It came in late into the thing, but I want to take you back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, pertaining to this um, this matter of um, Adam and Eve, right? That they never work. They, the first thing that they did was rested, right? Um, because they were created late in the evening of the in the in the the latter part of the of the sixth of the sixth day, right? Um, now I have a little. Um, beef on that, right? But this matter, because the commandment says that you that you should that you work and then you rest. Am I not right? You mentioned of working, you should work on the Sabbath. You should work, then rest on the Sabbath day, right? But I it, take it the does, point. It doesn't use yeah. the word then. It doesn't say work, then rest. It simply says six days shall thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath for the Lord. Right, right. Okay, fine. Um, my thing here is this, right? Is um, on the sixth day, God bought the animals to Adam, right? For Adam to name the animals, right? Wasn't that some element of work? We, we can say that. We can say that. Uh, but what is the work that, when you look at the Sabbath commandment in Exodus 20, yes. what work is God mentioning? Physical. Okay. Physical work. Right. Or, or you're looking at you're looking at that. But that's the point you want to, that I want yeah. to get to, right? Yeah. Because there are different um, elements of work, yeah. so to speak, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily have to be physical. Correct. You are asking yeah. me to engage my mental faculties or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. In doing something, and that is work. We've got some people okay. that just don't live. Uh, um, as you know, the, 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 you know, in, in our general um, thing, we've got some people that just um, lift a pen or whatever it is, mm, or they, mm. use, or they look, they use their mental faculties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Other than people who work, who mm, um, mm. do labor, mm. right? So, um, so that's where I take my... Um, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. And, and there's no arguing against that. What I want to add is this. God yeah. did give Adam and Eve work to do. Yeah. He says you shall tend the garden. Right. <laughs> and that is before sin. That is not after sin. That is before sin. Yes, yes, yes. So the assigned work given to Adam and Eve was to tend the garden. Okay. They had not, they didn't engage in that before the seventh day. Mm. Okay. Now, now the point, the point that I was making when I used that, um, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say that your point uh, let me let me say what i want to say the major point was 
that in the principles of righteousness by faith for mankind, rest comes before work. Mm -hmm. Because it, do it doesn't matter how we look at it. Adam and Eve did not help God in creation. Mm. Yes. When Adam and Eve came on the yes. scene, everything was created. Exactly. Yeah, fine. That is work. That is the work. God mm. worked from day one when he said, let there be light. Everything else was already created. Now God is inviting Adam and Eve to celebrate his creation which they did not participate in. So the Sabbath then becomes a gift to Adam and Eve in relation to creation. Yeah. Here is God asking us, now God is resting on the seventh day, right? Or the yeah. first seventh day of creation, God is resting. The Bible doesn't say that Adam and Eve are resting. It's, 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 it's a biblical assumption that Adam and Eve are resting, so don't hold me to that. Adam and Eve are resting with God. Ellison said they were engaged in their honeymoon, fine, whatever it is. But the, 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 the resting and the celebration of God's creation is the first full day of experience that our first parents had. Mm -hmm. So they are beginning their experience of existence while God is resting. We find the very same thing happening. Look at the plan of salvation. Look at the plan of salvation. Jesus, the Bible says, well, God created first six days, rested. Jesus comes to earth to redeem man from sin. Jesus says over and over in the book of John, I have come to do the work of my father. You ever read that? It's yeah, in John yeah. chapter five. I came to do the work that the father gave me to do. Let me ask you this. On which day of the week did that work finish? On which day of the week did the work... Did Jesus finish his work of redemption? You know it. You, you know it, but you probably don't know you know it. <laughs> on which day did Jesus say it is finished? On oh, the me, me on the Friday. On the Friday. Friday on the Friday day. evening. Day huh? number six. Yeah. yeah. On day number six, Jesus completed his work of redemption. Yeah. And the very first thing that Jesus says to the sinner, come unto me and I will mm -hmm. give you rest. Yeah. Before Jesus sends us out to work for him, he wants to ensure that we experience our rest in him. In other words, All right. the very same thing that happened at creation is being repeated at redemption. Jesus first calls us to rest in him by faith before we start working for him. Because if we do mm. not understand rest, we will be working for our salvation. Mm -hmm. Working for that which God gives for free. Paid by Jesus Christ. So we have to make those parallels. We have to make those connections. And sometimes we say yeah. things in, in our exuberance as, as preachers and things, we say things that we do not find the hard evidence for, but the principle, the principle is there. Exactly. So if, yeah. if you go back to the story of the prodigal son, the older boy who stayed home, look at, look at this carefully, look at this carefully. The Bible makes it clear in this parable. That's Luke chapter 15, is Luke chapter 15. Yeah. That when, when the younger boy comes to the father and say, give me that which belongs to me, the Bible makes it clear, Jesus in the parable makes it clear that the father divided his, his, his belonging between the two boys. He divided it up. In order to give the younger boy what belongs to him, he has to divide up the thing first. He divides up the, 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 his possession, gives the younger boy what belongs to him. The younger boy takes everything that belongs to him and he goes on a journey. Everything that is left belongs to whom? The other, the other child. The other child. Yet, mm. in the story, where do we find the other child? At home. N not at home. Mm -mm. He was working and he was upset. He was working in the field. 
Oh. There was a party. There was a party going on when the old, when the younger boy came back home. There was a party going on for him. Where was the older boy who stayed home? Where was he? Oh, I, I, I thought you meant. Uh, but I, what do you mean? He didn't left home. I know he didn't leave home, but where? Where <laughs> was he on the property? Yeah, he, he was. He was working. Yeah, in the, the field. field. The field. He yeah. was in the field working for that which belongs to him. Yeah, you understand that? Yeah. And Jesus is Jesus gave this parable because when you read the beginning of the chapter, chapter 15, he says, There were sinners and publicans and Pharisees and Sadducees listening to him. And Jesus is painting a picture for them. You Pharisees are busy working for that which God has given for free. Mm -hmm. You cannot work for your possession when it's already yours. And that's why Jesus wants us to understand who we are in him. Mm -hmm. before we go work for him mm. because we might be working for that which is already given to us for free that's why we have to understand the principles of righteousness by faith amen all right we have thank you very um, much amen. thank brother. you all right thanks master pa brother Corey, and then lloyd yeah good night to the um sports forum Body brothers, yes. family of God. Good night, special good night to past Peters. Blessings, good night. Um, sometimes when we think and study all these these different changes that could bring light to what we already possess as a truth, we need to think about the reformation that encourages this, this change. I mean to say that. Yes, people have kept the tradition of the church as according to the Sabbath as quote unquote salvation. The four walls is discussed just now. We discuss the way how to do it as a tradition. But being be, be in mind that that tradition has been passed down from the leadership. And if anyone is going to change, it will have to start there. Or, or, or if you decide on your own that you have seen the light in what you're saying, there is light to what you say about the way how we view the Sabbath is not really what God expects us to view. There's light in that. Because the Jews often was a clash with Jesus all the time because he transgressed the law of God with the traditions of men. And today we, we, we have to take that very serious. If we also transgress God's law of the Sabbath, but the traditions of men, or we are um, formulated, or we are um, structured. But get about the part there that the, the serious account is that God is taking this thing individually, individually, yes, but he's also taking the standpoint of reforming what we already keep as so close to us from the um, leadership standpoint. I mean, you could talk for the coast, come on. You could see the light, but it, as, as long as that leadership don't see light, it will always scatter the church one way or the time. You agree? Yeah, yeah, to an extent. As, as long as God don't do the same with our leadership, it will always scatter the church down the same way or the time. People come, people go, they will always be led with leadership in the way they design that it should go. And there's a lot of um, truth in the spread of concerning how we should keep this type of, not just in four walls. I see all sorts of a long time in my um, Adventist life that we need to go in the nature. And sometimes they will take my family to the beach and just look at the rocks and the shells, the little children, and, you know, see God's works. And what it was speak to us about, you know, since we talk about the butterflies and the worms, all these things to educate children. And we have come so far to be a stagnant, self keeping people, right? That our experience can grow because some of them have a lot to do with nature, you know, a whole lot to do with nature. And two, as soon as man was created, God gave him his appointed work. His appointed work wasn't really based on 
what he can do, but to keep his mind focused on his body and the organs, energetic and energized, he had to do something. And the, and the spirit policy tells us that the, the work that God gave him, let me just look back at that here, give you exact words. He says here, but he who for a man knew what would be best for his happiness. He no sooner created him than he gave him his appointed work. A life of useful labor is indispensable to the physical, mental, and moral being of man. So we see here that God knew exactly what Adam needed as a man going forward, as a man progressing, as a man knowing Christ. And one of those things was that Adam would just stick to a spiritual part. Yes, we understand that a relationship at the sign is all is entails all these things, but it also entails the physical rest too. And that must not be put aside. And you 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 alluded to a point that was very critical, is that people go go too far left when they talk about the righteousness by faith, and they get too far left when they talk about the laws and stuff. That is so evident. Right? And some some have come to uh, understanding that because righteousness by faith is being fatter, they can disallow the Sabbath, their Sabbath. And some preachers who will to be Hebrews rest and make a, a draft insult of the Sabbath before God. Right? I even saw um some uh some seventy Adventist preachers go up against. Pastor Jennings, you ever saw the videos? Probably not anyone in specific. Yeah, Pastor Jennings is a Pentecostal preacher. Yeah, yeah I know he, who he is, yeah. And, and he believes in the Sabbath, but not from the point of view of the Sabbath day. He will, he will stay assembly, the rest of Jesus Christ, he will stick to that. And many, I saw many um, pastors go up against him from um, Sabbath day, I read this, and were made like flower. Because he has a um, potential to make it look ugly. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> a lot of men go before him, boy, and don't got the guns ready, and they get, you know. But to, to say enough is that the Sabbath really entails the relationship with God. Yes, it is. And and you just, you specifically point to that relationship cannot be adhered to only on a day. And I thought this was preached a lot in the uh, business forum that if the Sabbath is start to understand from a weekly basis, when we come to the Sabbath day, we are really joyful. But the experience can only be explored from the first and six, and then the Sabbath will get the victory. That's how it's supposed to be. Thanks, man. Much appreciated. Yeah, man. Understand. Cool. Lloyd. Lloyd Paul. Um, you know, I, I had some of the, I had some of the stuff to talk about, but you know, with all the different contributions, I kind of, but I want to just, I want to just, um, I want to just speak a little bit about the Sabbath itself, and I, I, you know, the presentation from Pastor Peters was was good. I honestly, <laughs> I honestly wish when he stopped, it would have stopped. Because uh, as the questions come in, it 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 changed, it 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 add and it it more stuff that almost seems to distort the the the, the previous presentation. Uh, it kind of worked into it, and I, I I'm saying that to say to go into that direction where the Sabbath is concerned. As I an organization, you. as an organization, Pastor Peters and others. The Sabbath will never be kept or be observed. Let me put observe as it's supposed to. If you look at all what you've said about the faith, uh, um, you have faith in God, experience in certain things that that cannot be done in a organizational so. And that's my opinion. Eh? Anybody can disagree. It cannot be fully be impacted. In an in organizational structure, and that's why I asked the, the the brother from Jamaica when he was giving the presentation, 
Because when God came to Adam and Eve, it wasn't a organizational structure. It wasn't a church where with hierarchy. It was it was God having a communion, so to speak, with Adam and Eve. And I believe God wants to have the same communion with us one on one, not necessarily having to go to a nine o'clock service and follow all the the ritualistic stuff that we, we, we usually do. And you go in there and come back out empty. I think God wa- God wants to meet us one on one. It's like it's like a you make reference to the um the, the, the lady with the, the man with the ring, lady with the ring and if you're married or if you're not, uh, oh no, those who have the ring and those who just don't have the ring, but they, they know that they're married. It's a relationship that we have one on one. And sometimes when you're in a relationship, you do not need distraction. And it, you know, we can we can discuss and argue that. When you go to church, it sometimes it's more distraction than the real relationship or the, the communion you want to have. And so the whole structural stuff where, you know, the pastors and the leaders and all of this, and we know how it is set up and why it is set up that way. I think there should be more freedom, but the church cannot give you that either. You have to decide to, to make up your mind to do it by yourself. And I, I also appreciate what the brother before me said. Um, he make mention about that experience and that experience is something that we have to have between we and um, us and God, sometimes on an individual. It is a mention where two are free. So that 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 whole structural, um, that whole structural or denominational stuff that people are having, whether it's on Sunday, but we're talking about Saturday now, I don't think that works too much because I don't think originally that was the intention. When you talk about communion with God and faith in God, what you mentioned, and the real observance of the Sabbath based on a relationship. I heal for now. Thank you. Thank you. I understand where you're coming from. And if, you, if we connect that to what Corey said, uh, it, 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 it summed up nicely. If, if as individuals and if as, if as families and, and, and parents at home, we do not emphasize the relationship aspect of of religion because everything we do is is, is in the context of religion. Religion can be good or bad. So if in our religious instructions to our families, to our children, we don't emphasize relationship. We don't present the Sabbath as a relational thing. If we just present it as well, this is what Adventists do. This is the day that Adventists go to church. And these are the things that you can and cannot do. Then, then, then we miss the point. So if, if and uh, going back to what you said specifically, if you know, if you now know this truth and understand the significance of the Sabbath in the context of righteousness by faith and relationship with Jesus Christ and walking by faith, you know, you are now able to experience a Sabbath blessing, a Sabbath ness before you get into the walls of the church. And this is what is supposed to happen. Before we get to church at 9 a.m. on Saturday morning, we should have already been experiencing Sabbath and holiness and righteousness with God. So when we get into the house of worship, we come there to emanate holiness, to emanate righteousness. It flows from us. I came there to bless somebody. I came there to worship God. I came there to experience in a, in a communal family setting what we have been experiencing with our Savior. Sadly, most people go to church to encounter God. Mm. And when it doesn't happen, we say, boy, I didn't get nothing at church today. But you're not just supposed to go to church to get something. You're supposed to go to give something. You give what you have been experiencing with God all week. And this is Sabbath keeping. It's a celebration. But if you have nothing to celebrate, then Sabbath becomes instructions from your denomination. 
Sabbath observance cannot be instructions from the denomination. It has to be an encounter sweet fellowship with Jesus Christ. And so based on what Corey is saying, if as leaders we begin to teach that and, and, and the people understand that, before they come to church, they have been keeping Sabbath. You're not going to church to keep Sabbath. You're going to church because you have already been keeping Sabbath and you're now coming to fellowship with the rest of the believers because the Bible says do not forsake the assembly and so on. So there are a number of things that need to be put in place. And, and the sooner we do it, the more, the quicker the gospel goes out into the world. But the pastor, um, go ahead, Lloyd. Lloyd, you before, have to add to that? Yeah, just, can I just, I'm, I'm, but, you know, Pastor Peter, I, and I understand that what you're saying, I don't, I don't agree with it fully, but I understand it. Mm. Because I, I was born in that system and I grew up in it and I'm, I, I still, you know, you know, trying to get most of it or some of it out of my head. The mm. truth is, the truth is, when you when you go to church, and, and, and I have heard I've heard people spoke about you know you coming to share. Um, apart from the, apart from the the um thirty minutes of a a lesson that have been no 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 hold on hold on hold on I'm not talking about sharing information you know. What are you talking about? An experience with God. And then encounter with God. In other words, how, how do you, when, how do you, when you walk in, sorry, let me just say this. When you walk into somebody's presence, you're supposed to get that, that, that spirituality, that energy, that, that holiness that flows. You cannot be filled with, the, with God's Holy Spirit and it not emanate from you. That is what I'm talking about sharing. I'm not talking about going up and, and giving Sabbath school lesson. And, and, uh, it, it's beyond that. It's, it's greater than that. So, so, so you're saying your presence is what does the, that whatever comes out of you, that is the yeah. sharing aspect you're talking about. Primarily, but, yes. But, but Pastor Peters, most people don't even know what that is. That's I what mean, I'm saying. That is, they, they don't know what that is. And, and yeah. I understand where you are because you are, and I will, I will tell it to you straight up, you are in a position where you, 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 either you, 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 you dig into more truth and you're getting more knowledge. And on the same aspect, you are, you have a relation, not only a relationship, but you have an obligation, is the word, to, to, to a system that is not necessarily clapping to what, what you are indulging in in terms of your, 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 your knowledge and, and what your research and other studies that you've been doing. And I, I can see where you know, that could create not only for you, but for, for real, for Adventists who have been in this thing for a long time, it creates a little, um, you know, hurdle and a little fight because both of those things cannot survive in the same context, nor in the same realm. One has to give way for the other. And, and, and that is what has been going on with people who have been doing, um, you, know, uh, you know, presentations and the studies and learning more and trying to move away from the traditional way of doing things that is really not of any benefit. And it has not benefit, well, I'll say me and a lot of people in the past, and I don't know if it didn't benefit anybody now, but people are tied into that system. And it's very difficult when you get new light or new information or, or other things to get tied both together. And that is why I'm, I'm asking a question about sharing and, and, yeah. and going to church because it doesn't always end up in the right, right mix. I understand you. Yeah. All right. Swanky has a question. Uh, come in, Swanky. Yeah, it was <laughs> some of what Lloyd said there. I was going to ask Pastor Peter too, because I wanted to find out how you're doing that sharing. Because if you're going to go to an institution, right, whereby most of the persons do not even understand the same concept that you have of what the relationship with god should be with should be like and the understanding of really and truly um appreciating the sabbath for what it really is how do you share how do they share with you and wouldn't that be wasting your time because if you're going among persons who you say you're supposed to have this kind of holiness kind of feeling and whatever so it's it's emulating or it's coming out from you but it is not coming out from the other person so it is like a disadvantage. There's like a battery, the negative and the positive. 
So there is no, there is only negative coming out of one end and no positive. How, how, how does that function? That's my first question to you. The sec, the let, let's, let's take it one at a time. My, my, Answer this my, my retention kind of load is this. Let's take it one question at a time. Um, you know, you know the saying that we have, you, you meet somebody for the first time and you just say, I like his, I like that person's spirit. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That's, that's a saying we have. There, there is something about that person. I don't know what it is, but, but we click from the first time we met, we click. And the opposite also happens. You meet somebody and you don't know nothing about them. And you just say, but it's something about that person. Not right. Okay. This is, this is a real thing. This is a discerning aspect of the Holy Spirit. This is discernment. In other words, I heard this, I heard this statement many years ago, and I pray God I never forget it. This is what uh, it was said. Wherever you go, you should preach the gospel. And only when it's necessary should you speak. You got that? Wherever you go, preach wow. the gospel. And only when it is necessary should you speak. Mm -hmm. In other words, when a believer who is walking in holiness, walking in righteousness, with an encounter, a vibrant relationship with God, walk into your presence, walk into the fellowship of believers, people sense that. The way, you, the way you relate to people, the way you love people, the way you greet people, the way you treat people, Say more about the God you serve than what you say. Amen, amen. So when I talk about sharing, I really was not talking about speaking. I'm not talking about the pastor going up to preach a sermon or the superintendent getting up to speak. I'm saying when we get into the presence of the believers, there is something that comes from us. We feed off each other. And it is true. Many times people, other people come there empty because they have not encountered God. But sometimes they feed, you have something to give them. I know it is sometimes frustrating when, when, you, when you get into a, a fellowship and, and, and things are not on the same wavelength. You're not on the same wavelength with other people. These are some things that we have to live up to God. But God wants, in other words, God is saying to us, I want you to be the salt of the earth. You cannot sally pueso if the sal, if the salt not in the pueso. Yes, you have to mix. You have to mix. Well, for to me, to be the salt. Go ahead. Well, but Peter, for me, that one about going to the church, it would not work out with me because. No, no, I'm not talking about the physical church. I'm not talking about the physical building. I'm talking about relating to people. But, but, yeah. Talking about the church that God speaks about, where one or two are gathered, two or three. Where, are gathered, wherever, right? wherever it is, wherever you encounter people. Point taken, very yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wherever you encounter people. I'm not talking about going to a particular location, going to Castries as the No, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about that at all. Whether you're on the bus, whether you're on the road, whether you're on work, at work, on wherever you are as a student at school, wherever you are, ministry, Christianity happens right there where you share the love of Jesus Christ, where you share the kingdom of God. And sometimes you don't even have to speak to say that. Over and over, people meet you. Boy, you, I, I, I don't know who you are, but I, I see something about you. You're a Christian, right? They ask you, are you a Christian? You, yeah, because they could see the vibes. That is holy living. If you're a good, you're a good person, they don't really use the Christian term. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, my next question was, you said something, yeah. that, well, not really a question, but a comment. You said something that was very important earlier on. Remember when you were explaining to the guy before Lloyd? And you were explaining that um, with Adam and Eve, God shed, God shed um, that day and gave them like, you know, gave them the right to share that form of happiness. You understand that, that, yeah. that of his works. I think that that goes far off to us, you know, he has extended that courtesy towards us. Mm. First, share in that opportunity of, 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 of um, enjoying his creation. So it did not stop when on the on the very first Sabbath with Adam and Amen. Eve. It Amen. Throughout the generations, I think that's a very yeah. important thing to add to what you were saying. I got that from what you were saying that that was very good. Amen. That Amen. God Amen. extended that courtesy through all of us to all of us through His Son Jesus Christ. That's what it is. 
And so it is a wonderful thing to give praises and to to bless God on 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 um, every single day. But most importantly, that day that we should keep holy and that we should and and like you rightfully said, it's not just a day because a lot of people just believe okay, you know they 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 have to. So like if one for example one day they can't go to church, they feeling like as if they're in prison because they can't go to church. Ah, uh, right. Whatever. Yeah. 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 And and like for me, when I tell people I I I I I worship on a Saturday, and then they ask me, "You're seventh day," and I say, "No." But how come? Because and when I take certain Saturdays and I am not able to worship and I have certain things to do and I do it, and they're like, "But to me, that's not your Sabbath." I say, "But it's, yes, it's God's Sabbath, but God is not going to punish me because I have certain things to do and I I don't stay inside today to worship." So yeah. a lot of people don't understand that they think. You have to be imprisoned. It's like um, a duty, and they don't feel the free rest brings freedom. Amen. And they don't feel the freedom in rest that they're supposed to feel. They feel like they're burdened, and if you are burdened to do something, obviously you're yeah. stressed about it, and it, it yeah. causes you to be tired and not resting. I yield. Amen. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right on. Right on. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Um, anybody else had a question? I had one that I wanted to ask, but um, if there's anybody who has another question, feel free to. Uh, Sterling, Sterling, that is on the floor. Oh, Sterling, yes, yeah, Sterling. Um, I'm reminded that you that you were that you had a question. There's a question and a statement. Um, with, I asked the question I asked Pastor Peters earlier. Um, Corey kind of touched it, touched what I I was afraid of, and that is this system of Adventists where they they they, they keep the Sabbath um, and they they love nature, so they spend a lot of they're either worshiping at church or they're out in nature. And even here, that have taken off like a rocket. So lots of people spend the Sabbath out in nature. How did Jesus spend the Sabbath? People, please. It's not out in, the Sabbath is not about you, even in nature. You're making it about you. The Sabbath is about God helping the people. Jesus said, in as much as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren. Yeah. The Sabbath is about helping people. Two houses down the road from you, there's somebody that need help. There's an old lady in the district that probably have not had a bath for the entire week or haven't had a good cooked meal. Or oh, oh, the roof or the roof is leaking. That's right. That's right. On, On the Sabbath is the time you do those things. Helping people. Not enjoying yourself. I'm sorry, Brother Corey. On the beach. And out in the forest. And going on nature heights. That is still about you. But you are to forget your own pleasure. And do God's pleasure. And what is God's pleasure? Listen Isaiah. To people. Yeah, taking care of people. people. Looking looking after the widows and the orphans, yeah. the, the, the homeless. And COVID has presented such a challenge for so many families. Perfect time to yeah. reach out and help people. But we still think that the Sabbath, we, we still have this funny concept about the Sabbath and I don't know um, Lloyd Lloyd mentioned my second point is Lloyd mentioned I, I, I love his conversation it just woke up some some things in my head and sent me on a real mission worshipping under the stringent laws of religion is hard it's hard to keep the Sabbath it's hard to worship um, by faith, under all these stringent laws of religion. 
and that's a fact. <coughs> I don't want to put you in trouble, Pastor, because you are the missionary to the Adventist Church. <laughs> <laughs> and you are to teach them. But the truth is, <laughs> the truth is, yeah. Jesus, Jesus tried with the disciple, with, with uh, sorry, with the Jews. He tried with them, but there was a time coming when he had to just brush them off because they, they worship under the constraint of laws, and a, a man under the constraint of laws are a prisoner. He cannot and be that free. That is the point, Stalin. That is the point. Uh, sorry, I Go yield. <laughs> right on, right on. Um, um, where does where does the law comes in in Sabbath keeping? That's the question yeah. I have to Pastor Jason. Like the where Sabbath, the, the, the Sabbath law in the yes, Ten Commandments. Yes, yes. It falls in. It falls in. In other words. Let, let me let me use marriage as an example. I've, I've used marriage so much so many times this evening. Let, let me use marriage. Where does where does not being unfaithful come into marriage? All depends to what you call unfaithful. I um yeah, 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 Pastor Peter, you may not want to go that road. I, I see, yeah. yeah. There was a camera on earlier and I saw a little child, so I, I don't want to be too graphic. But, um, and make I don't it, know who was listening. Just make, make it unfaithful. Um, unfaithful, yeah. Unfaithful. Yeah, unfaithful. What unfaithful means. Yeah. In other words, I do not go with, with, with a notepad and say to my wife, well, I didn't do this this week. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. I, I didn't do none of those things. It means that I love you. No. Sabbath keeping, the things that God says not to do on Sabbath. And by the way, God, did, God didn't give us an exhausted list. You know? God gave an example of, of the, the, the civil work, the, the, the mundane regular work that we should cease from that have nothing to do with him. That have nothing to do with which may, which may prevent our communion with him. But we can still do some of those things and have communion with God because those things are helping people. They are people related directly in, in terms of what constitutes worship to God. Because I love God, because I'm worshiping God, I can do those things. And Jesus says, have you not read of the priests who work on Sabbath and are violating the Sabbath? So in our relationship, in our walk with God, as it relates to Sabbath keeping, Keeping in mind all the things that we said about faith, the faith encounter with God, the faith experience with God, because I am in relationship with God, because I understand what Sabbath represents, I am not doing those things because of my relationship with God. Not that I'm trying to bribe God into blessing me. I'm not trying to impress God with my good works. I am living in relationship with God. Therefore, I am not doing those things. I love my wife, therefore I am not doing those things. I love my husband, my husband, so I am not doing those things. It's an expression of love. Okay, okay so it's then an my, expression I, of love. I get your answer. So yeah. now I'm going to take you, I'm going to take you one step further. You love your wife, so you don't do those things. But what what if what if you step out on your wife? Mm -hmm. What happens? There can God. be forgiveness and reconciliation. With God. Yeah. And there the can, be. There can, can be. be. There can be. And there is. Oh, all right. Okay. No. There is. No. What does it mean that we are not under the law? Well, that phrase, that phrase is used, if I'm not mistaken, on in two different contexts. In the New Testament, Give one me. meaning under the condemnation of the law. We give are no longer a, under the condemnation of the law go, because give of. Me a, give me a context. Give me, give me the context in where that yeah, was. Gonna, say that again. Give me a context in where that was used. 
before you go to the other context, the condemnation. Let me see, let me see if I could remember, uh, get the reference itself. Romans Is that the Galatians or Romans? See if you could help me there, Pastor. One. Say that. Romans 8 1. Romans 8 1 is one is one context here. How does where does condemnation come there? Yeah, I can't get lost. Um, while he's looking for that, um, Ellison, the priest on the Sabbath is not under the condemnation of the law of the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, the priest is free to partake uh, of work that would other would be a would be wrong if another person did it on the Sabbath. So the priest on the Sabbath is free. Every person who is in Christ is free on the Sabbath. They're, they're not to be under the condemnation of the law. So they can do the work. They can go and work, work helping people because the priest is a minister on the Sabbath. As long as you are a minister, you are working. You're free from that law that said thou shalt not work. Okay, Stalin. Okay, okay. Yes, just yes, Pastor. You, I would yeah, so, context. yeah the, the context is the soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. Uh -huh. All have sinned. Are you are you superimposing something else there? No, no, no. This this is one of the contexts. That's why I was trying to remember get the other text to give the full context. So one context is we are no longer under the condemnation of the law. And the question is how or why? What no, because place you see, you see, you see my problem with that before you even go further. Mm -hmm. That is that is what I am hearing from seven the Adventists, but that's not what I'm hearing from the Bible. Because there's no way in no writing of Paul that he used being under the law as condemnation of the law. There's no way in Paul's writing. I hear that from explanation from church members, from pastors rather, mm. but not from the Bible. You have the text for that? That you're Roman talking about, the particular text? Roman 6, 14. Mm. Romans 6, 14, for sin have not, for sin shall not have dominion, dominion over, over you because you. you are not under the law. Yeah. Okay. The, there's no way in that. No, no, that, that's, that's not the text, man. Okay. Galatians 3. Um, Figo, can you get that? What's that? In Galatians, we Paul see we are not under the law. Right. Galatians 3 6, I'm not, I'm not sure. Because that, that of itself, when we, when we come to that understanding of what we say, when we say we are not under the law, Romans 6 15. That is one of them. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Yes, that is one of them. Okay. Um, Romans, right. Romans what? Three, Romans chapter 3 verse 14. It says Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us for it is written. Romans six fifteen is the one I just um, shared and there is Galatians there is Galatians um 421, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? But if you are led by the Spirit, Galatians 5, 18, you are not under the law. Galatians 4, 4. Non, non, none of those texts are in the context of what I was talking about, under the no. condemnation. That's not, that's not it. None of them. Those texts that were just mentioned are right. rulership, dominion. That's right. Yeah. That's right. 
and, and, Galatians 4, God and sent for his son, one of a woman have, under the law. Yeah. Anytime we have that understanding wrong, we will have Sabbath keeping wrong too. Mm. You must have it wrong. Because then, then we are going back to the law and give all kind of fancy food thing of why we should do this and why we mm. should do mm. that. Because, okay, got you, got you. because we have that understanding, we are not under the law wrong. And I a couple a couple of years ago, when I used to do Sabbath school lesson, I remember that the author was trying to bring that in there that um um under the law is um um condemnation. And then not one of his scripture that he brought out supported what he was saying but you know what it's a common thing to say but it doesn't say it mm -hmm. no no when paul says we are not under the law it means we are not governed we are not ruled yeah, by yeah. The, law. the law so we are not ruled by in it you shall do no work we are not ruled by that yeah but and, there is, yeah, I, I get you, Alison, and, and, and you're and right. I, I, I want to tell someone, I want to tell someone and everyone, you, the, the, what God did for us is set us free. Jacob and the children, the, the children that left Egypt, sorry, left, uh, uh, went to Egypt, sorry. The descendants of Jacob that went to Egypt did not have that law. They did not have it. Is is when they stayed in Egypt for four hundred and something years, God gave them those laws, and He gave them those laws for a purpose, just for what you said earlier. That they would understand the resting in Christ, resting in God. You see, Abraham did not have the law, and Abraham rejoiced to see the day of the Lord. Even and his descendants, when when that day came, it was a sad day for him for them. As a matter of fact, they killed him. Abraham rejoiced and he did not have that law. Abraham did not have in it you shall do no work, neither Jacob. But he gave it to their descendants. And that is what we have to start thinking about. Those are, those, those are the areas we have to start going. And, and some may say is an extreme. Okay. But we... We cannot just superimpose things yeah, on correct, the people. Yeah, you? what, yeah you're, you're, you're correct. The, the text that we highlighted talk about dominion and governance, which Christ has set us free from. So when Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore no, no condemnation, it's in relation to that. Uh, but there is, a, there is a biblical concept of condemnation, which is brought by the law which are not the texts that we talked about. In other words, the Bible says, the soul that sinneth it shall die, which is the law. The soul that sinneth it shall die, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Therefore, um, Paul says, by one man, judgment came and condemnation came. So that is the condemnation that came over us because we were sinners, which Christ has now saved us from. So it was in that context I was answering the question, not from the text point of view. But the text, the, the, the comments you made on the text are correct. Because, and just to take it one step further, if anybody is, is, is questioning it, Galatians 4 and verse 4, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Jesus Christ was made under the law. That means the law governed him. The law controlled him. He had to do whatever the law said it had to do in order to take us out from under that law. 
And sadly, when you speak to Seventh Day Adventists like that, they, they in church they, they they have a red flag over your head, okay? <laughs> because they're watching you closely, even though you're saying what the Bible says. Mm. Jesus Christ had to do those things to get us out from it because that was a yoke on the people born. That's why Paul says, Mount Sinai gendereth to bondage. Mm. It gendereth to bondage. In Galatians 4 and 21, tell me you would desire to be under the law. Don't you hear what the law say? Abraham had two sons, one from a born woman, one from a free woman. These are allegories of the two covenants. The uh, Mount Sinai, which generates to bondage, and Jerusalem, and, and Jerusalem, uh, uh, sorry, um, um, it, Ishmael, which generated to bondage, and Isaac. Isaac, which is the promise, which is Jerusalem, which is from above. And, and which, have, which is a description, which is Paul's explanation of the same righteousness by faith. That's right. That's right. And in that description, when you see, when, when he used that Mount Sinai, gender F to bondage, we have to look at that closely. Because a lot of times what we do, we take people back to Mount Sinai. In it, you shall do no work. In that gender F to bondage. Yeah. When it should be a celebration of freedom. And, 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 and and you cannot have freedom, you cannot have freedom when you are telling people, not you, you know, Pastor. <laughs> when you are telling people you church at nine o'clock, and that's what that's what you have to do. That's no freedom. No, no, no. no. I, I want to I want to tread cautiously there. Because in, in, in that, in that, I am the freedom that we have, it resembles, it resembles, I repeat, in, it resembles doing what you want. Hmm. It resembles doing anything. That's why Paul says. Do not make that mistake in Galatians 5 and verse 13, I think. Do not make that mistake and take that freedom as a license to sin. Because the freedom, it, 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 it's so close to do whatever you want. That's why Paul says, Galatians and Romans 6 and verse 4. Um, 6 and verse, verse 1, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Why he says that? Because in, in Romans 5 and 23, he said, they all have sinned and come short of the glory. No, 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 no. no. He said, um, 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 we are sin abound. Grace take your much take, more take your time. abound. Take, take your time. <laughs> grace <laughs> much more abound. So that looks so close to doing what you want, and he come and give the disclaimer, shall we continue in sin? Don't even think about it. A lot of times, what I hear preaching, it doesn't, it doesn't resemble you can do what you want. And, and we try to stay as far as possible, lest somebody misunderstand you and they do whatever they want. Let me tell you, they're doing whatever they want all the time. So not now they're going, it's not that going to make them do what they want. Let we, when we preach the gospel as Paul sends it, that's what happens.